Hi, everybody. This is Rachel Yellen of Yes to Birth, and I am beyond excited to tell you that I am here in Durango, Colorado, with my dear friend, Suzanne Arms. Um, some of you might know Suzanne Arms because she wrote the incredible book in the 1970s called Immaculate Deception, uh, which was a total game changer in the in the in the birth world and um suzanne and i have become very very good mm -hmm. friends and i'm on this cross-country road trip between san francisco and south carolina and uh, she invited me to come stay and we've had a wonderful time together talking about all kinds of juicy uh juice juicy things last night we talked about female orgasm and we uh we've just been talking about politics and and, um, and enjoying the land here. The land is magnificent. We're at her home in, is it Bayfield? Bayfield, Colorado. Bay, in Bayfield, Colorado. And we're sitting here with, here with her, you can't, you can't see the cat, but um, her amazing, amazing cat who is a total survivor. Um, he, he survived a dog, a dog attack uh, about a month or so ago and he's recovering quite well. And I just, I wanted to take this opportunity to, to, um, share with you uh, the ways in which um, not only Suzanne has inspired me in my work, but that she's inspired millions, has helped millions of people uh, in, in ways that, that are so profound. Um, you know, talking about the nature of the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine and um, inspiring mothers to really take responsibility over what it means to have a child and to to really see the importance of how children are raised because the, the work that she is doing is transforming the the ways in which children are brought into this world and carried through in the rest of their lives so that we can survive as, as a species so I'm not going to do, I, I'm very informal here. I'm just noticing that I have this tank top on and I can see my bra hanging out, but you know, it is what it is because I'm, I'm on vacation. Um, and I just wanted to share, uh, rather than me taking all this time to, to introduce Suzanne, I think she'll do a better job. So what I want to do is first say hello and, um, hey, and say, welcome, <laughs> welcome me to your home. And, um, and to just, if you could just take, take a minute and just tell everybody you know, your, your heart's passion, you know, what, what you okay. what you've been brought here to do and, um, just what, what is your heart's passion? What's your, your work in the world right now and where, okay. what's led you to this place? Well, a lot of people feel that, um, as people mature and find their wholeness, they are called back to what it was they yearned to do about the eight, when they were about 10 years old. And when I was about 10 years old, I remember thinking to myself or saying out loud, and I have no idea why, I'm going to make the world safe for children. Now, at the time, I had no conscious awareness that I was being sexually abused by my father from the age of three, and that I had enormous trauma from my birth and whatever. But uh, that propelled me as the daughter of two very bright teachers who actually wanted me. Um, despite the abuse, you know, even my father and my mother's denial of it. Uh, they wanted me. I was a wanted child. That's the worst thing that a child can go through, an adult can go through, is not having been wanted, not ever having been welcome. So fast forward, graduate with, you know, in literature and anthropology with a great curiosity for how do other cultures do things? Why do we do the things we do? What would we do if we couldn't, if we didn't have the tools we have now what would they do in other cultures and so on? And it's something I ask of doctors and everybody, you know, okay, if you can't, if you didn't have the tools to do this cesarean right now, what would you do for this woman and this baby? And uh, I became a nursery school teacher and moved to San Francisco, became a Head Start teacher. And, um, and then what, there was the, the Vietnam War and I was a political social activist trained by the Quakers to be a draft counselor, to talk to men whose only decision prior to allowing themselves to be inducted in or going, choosing to go into the Vietnam War was what color car they wanted. I mean, really, they had no preparation for killing a human being far away who had done nothing to them, much less being killed. So 
that was part of it. And I was also working as an activist with them to end capital punishment, which we know is still happening in this country. So I became an activist early on and then an environmental activist, anti-nuclear activist with Helen Caldicott's work. And it wasn't until I had a baby, till I got pregnant, that I got blown away by the issue of birth, basically, because I was living in Marin County, California, north of San Francisco at the time. And uh, people were having home births. They were having natural births. And that's what I wanted. But I was very conflicted because I also had had an extremely traumatic birth. I didn't know about it. My mother never mentioned it to me until after Molly came. Um, that her legs were held together and my head was pushed back with every contraction because it was the doctor's night off. And he told her, Eleanor, don't have, don't go into labor on Tuesday night. It's my poker night. So, of course, I, being an Aries, decided to come on a Tuesday. Now, you know, it took me many years to take any responsibility for this. I just felt such a victim of my birth, my traumatizing birth. And it was also a time when babies were routinely separated, put in nurseries, and because there was an epidemic of infant diarrhea, um, mothers weren't allowed to see their babies, much less breastfeed them. But, you know, my mom had already been told by a pediatrician with my brother's birth six years earlier, also under twilight sleep, which is this horrible concoction of narcotics and, and music drugs. When he, she asked him about breastfeeding, he said to her, Eleanor, you're a school teacher, not a cow. Now, shame has been used across the centuries to keep children in line, but especially to keep women in line. It's been used by religions, it's been used by educators, it's been used by parents, grandparents. It's shame is a very powerful shaping tool. So, of course, my mother didn't breastfeed any of her kids, and, um, and I was finally allowed to be born, allowed to be born and almost died, then separated from her, then nobody touched me except the nurses in the nursery, thank God. And uh, of course, I wasn't breastfed, wasn't slept with, wasn't worn, none of that. So now I know that that was the beginning of what caused me to come into the world with a hell of a head of steam. Because if you've got this force, which is the strongest muscle in the body during labor is, is the uterus, stronger than the heart. And, uh, and if you've got a hand, a nurse's hand, pushing your head back in, holding with her other arm, your mother's legs together, um, you're caught in a double bind. <laughs> yeah. Because nature wants you to be born, you want you to be born, and babies really do participate in their birth. And so, when I wrote Immaculate Deception, <laughs> Hi, Birds, which is my second book. Uh, as a result of the birth of Molly, my first season to be born was really a diary with the photographs her father did to help me through my fear of pregnancy and labor, not knowing why I was afraid that I would die in childbirth. He suggested I do this because there was nothing in the field out except Elizabeth Bing's wonderful Six Easy Lessons for Childbirth. And... Uh, Grantly Dick Reed's book, mm -hmm. Childbirth Without Fear. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the first book, he photographed, and it became this diary called A Season to Be Born that many people still have on their shelves. I was in 73. But after she was born, I had this passion to find out, A, what was the truck that hit me in birth? Who was the driver? And why? Why were women having these kinds of births? Because the more I talked to women, the more I realized and discovered that, in fact, it was a very typical birth. It was a vaginal birth, just had, having to have all kinds of drugs. In fact, on page 69 of the original edition of Immaculate Deception are all the list of interventions I had. I had every drug that they had, but I didn't have a cesarean. And every single one, from the nicental to the demerol to the paracervical block anesthetic to the caudal, which predated the, and spinal, which predated the epidural. Every single one of them was taken off the market because within years, because they were found to be dangerous for the developing baby's brain. So I should say to people that I owe a hell of a lot to people who woke me up along the way as I was researching to find out what the truck was that hit me. Um, Doris Hare being a huge one who started the Maternal Child Health Association and put on vast 
conferences for nurses and midwives and educators way back in the 70s and said to me then, she said, you have to go to Holland, you have to go to England, you have to go to Denmark, you have to see what's happening in birth over there and you have to see how things are falling in the country that's still holding on to natural birth, which was uh, Holland. And just before she died, about a year and a half ago, in her 80s, she said to me, Suzanne, remember to tell everyone not one drug that has ever been used and still is used in pregnant women in birth has ever been proven safe for the developing baby's brain. And Doris Hare... Wait, we have to pause. We have to pause on yeah. that because that is, that is so significant. Stunning. It's so significant. Stunning. That... She got package inserts into drugs. As a consumer advocate in Washington, D.C., that's what she did. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. I'm rattling on. No, I love it. I love it. I always, you know, this is why we're doing this interview, because I could listen to you talk, you know, for, for hours. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm so inspired. And I'm Thank also you. aware of, as I'm listening, and hopefully as other people are listening, some of the, you know, the stories line up, you know, different aspects. Like, as you talk, I realize I share so many of, or so much of the same experience. You know, it looks a little bit different, but, um, but I share so much yeah. of that experience around separation from mother as um, I, I was a scheduled C-section and my mom was a big advocate of natural birth. She had two natural births in Manhattan in 1968 and 69. And then my third sister was born in Korea and the, the doctor didn't know what to do when she was quote stuck. And so my mom had a cesarean. So when I was born 1972, there was no VBAC birth. That's right. And it, and what's, what's interesting of course is about the, the separation from mother. And then, uh, and then I wasn't breastfed. It wasn't, you know, hip at that time. A lot of and of course, doing now, that. Mm -hmm. newest research is showing right. that the most vital drug in the gut, in the human gut, is this incredible um, bacteria. bacteria, good bacteria that eats all of the bad, toxic bacteria. Right. And it is missing from children. Right. in this country, and primarily because of lack of breastfeeding, cesarean birth, and overuse of antibiotics, and I'm right. going to add a fourth because they don't quantify it yet, and that is stress, maternal stress. Right. So, so uh, uh, yeah, Doris here was right. And what are we doing about it? Nothing. But in, in Brazil, they're starting to study the long-term impact of epidurals mm -hmm. on babies at age five and how they learn and what they learn one-to-one -one interviews with these kids, they're finding their brains are different. One of the things that I'm very aware of as you and I have been talking over the last 24 hours uh, is this deep dedication that so many of us birth workers have around making sure that no woman feels shamed about her choices and how important it is to, to you know, honor where women are at. And part of what um, we've been talking about uh, is this, this delicate balance. You know, we never want anybody to feel shamed. We always want women to feel, you know, to feel honored and to feel respected. And then simultaneously, we're so acutely aware of how so many women are making their choices based on false information or lack of information and fear and fear of course yeah. and if women really understood the level of importance of um of making choices around where to give birth being in environments where they're going to be supported and with practitioners who are experienced enough to handle the variety of uh, circumstances that can arise during birth that if women are educated about that if they make choices around that if they um, if they plan and they prepare, and I've, so of course that's what I do in my work, is I, my whole work is steeped in getting prepared for birth so that a woman knows how to go inward, knows how to be deeply connected to her baby, knows how, what to do with her body, knows how to focus and concentrate and relax so that her body can, can her brain can shift into the mammalian birthing response, an animal birthing response, and that the birth can unfold the way nature intends. You know, so we, yeah, let me take it from there yeah, because please. there are a couple of things that are so difficult around birth, and one of them is we're using the wrong term. It is not birth. It is not an event. It is a series of highly refined biological 
hormonal processes that start preconception as the egg is epigenetically being shaped by forces in the mother's environment, what she eats, whether she smokes, how much stress there is, whether, you know, the roundup on her lawn is getting into her because that will go to the baby's brain, whatever. That the time from preconception on to through the first year as the baby starts to get up and walk and toddle, but actually until right into toddlerhood, um, are critical. We now call this the primal continuum of human development. And people can look up primalcontinuum.org. And that's two years, primal continuum. And they can also look at birthingthefuture.org, um, which is my nonprofit. We're trying to get people to understand that birth is not a day in your life or a two days. It's not an event. It is this complex, interlocking, interdependent processes in which the mother and baby are one biological system. People don't get that. Now, they're not a biological system once that woman starts bottle feeding. But as long as they're breastfeeding for that first year, they're on the same sleep wake pattern. They are, I mean, they're carrying the same hormones that flood through the baby's gut, go Wait, through the ask, mother's. If there's breast milk in the bottle, is it the same? Is it the bottle that's the problem or is it's it the, the, the it's, content of the bottle? It's both. Okay. Um, you, can, you can bottle feed a baby breast milk if you have that baby or a toddler in an all position facing your chest, not facing away and shoving a bottle in what I call the distracted bottle feeding pose, but an engaged skin contact and ideally open shirt, naked chest to naked chest, even better naked body of baby to naked mother's upper body wrapped with a shawl or whatever she needs so she can do that anywhere, then they are getting the skin to skin contact they need, which is part of the breastfeeding. So it's breastfeeding as well as breast milk. It's the fact that the jaw is doing this. Feel your jaw, feel your neck audience. This is a complete release yeah of the cranial sacral nerves. And um, it releases any tension in the body. It gets the jaw to grow the teeth right. So the action on the breast is actually critically important. And the transfer of the energy between the mother and baby, and I had a psychic 22 years old who has never had a baby, talk to me about what she sees when a mother and baby are breastfeeding. But this is critically important because even at a biological level, we now know when the baby catches a virus, then it will inject the virus into the mother's breasts through the holes around the nipple. And the mother's milk, mother's body will turn that into a formula in the breast milk that heals the virus and the, best, the baby then feeds on the milk that the mother created to get rid of the virus. Besides, breast milk changes hour to hour as well as feed to feed, and therefore you can never have a formula that does the same. But of course, we have no maternity leave, no paid maternity leave. We are a woman-hating, mother-hating, child-hating consumer society. We're not a democracy. We are a consumer oriented capitalistic society designed to create people who will grow up to become teenagers who will buy whatever genes they're told are the most expensive and will get them liked. That's it. That's who we are. Well, if you have the maternal attachment you need, if you protect the woman, if the woman finds a way to make her way through this very stressful world, to give this baby an inner sense of protection, if she finds a way to love this baby, even if she didn't want to be pregnant, but decided to keep the pregnancy and not abort, there are so many things that happen because she's the universe to this baby. And of course, then there's the father or partner who actually envelops her and creates this bubble of protection around her that should be a whole community. But today, many women have nobody. So... From the get-go, we have to change all this because if we want to get a different outcome, which is a world without war, which is a world without rape, which is a world without shaming, which is a world without people spending 
two thirds of their income in Africa buying infant formula from Nestle's because they've given the women infant formula for six weeks for free until the milk dries up and then get them on the formula and takes all them. Anyway, if we want to create a different world, a cooperative world, a world with people thriving, healthy, children contributing, delighted to be alive, we have to create a different kind of human being. And that is all about how we wire the brain and heart. It's about the mother child as one unit. It's about the influence and impact of the father, of men, of partners, whatever gender they call themselves, whatever sex they are. It's about community. And we have to change all of this. And it can be done in one generation. We've got the scientific evidence to prove it. We've got human biology, biological, sound biological principles that are ecologically sound, sustainable, cheap. It's like, yeah, it's doable, fans. We can do it in one generation. So and that's where, my passion. Where can where can um, the listeners learn more about you know everything that you're talking about? I know there's the the birthingthefuture dot right. They website. can go to the birthingthefuture dot org. Has a lot of products on it, films and posters and bookmarks and, and your masterclass. And then I've this. done a six series master six master class series called the human attachment project the human attachment project As of tomorrow, and where can they find that well it is going to be on the home page of the website with my free introduction to immaculate deception me reading with oh. talks i've given on the human soul and why there's so much alienation and disconnection and this human attachment project has two links on youtube one is to the trailers, the six trailers, and the others to the six classes. And it's all free because I want this information out right. there. And it's not just for people having babies. It's because we were all born. And we were we shaped were by born, what happened yes. to us. And we don't have to spend the rest of our life repairing what we missed in childhood. Right. We could change it in one generation. And you and I could go and sit on a beach on a Greek island ride old scooters and do art. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you for having this me. This has been so wonderful. Thank <laughs> you so much. And thank you all for joining us. What thank a, you for bearing with us. <laughs> we've, we've loved being with you. And um, if I can be helpful to you in any way, or if you have any questions, uh, contact yes to birth.com or racheljellen.com. And um, we we'll look forward to, or I'll look forward to seeing you on my next interview. I don't know who that's going to be and when it's going to be, but it'll happen at some point. All right, everybody. Take thank care. you, Rachel. You're welcome.